Welcome to another video lecture of Mr. Mosher's 8th grade American history class. Uh, again, we're looking at the groups who are settling the West um, after the American Civil War between 1860 and 1900. Uh, in, in the last lecture, we looked at the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And in this one, we're going to look at another important law uh, that will get passed uh, during the Civil War um, that's going to have a huge impact, again, on this interest in the West. So let's look here at some of the things we're going to need to know today for our lecture. Again, the reading for this textbook, uh, for this section, comes out of the textbook from chapter 18, uh, pages 600 to 602. Uh, you don't necessarily have to read the entire section. Uh, the part that deals with the Homestead Act, which is the part that we're going to be talking about today, uh, primarily comes from those two pages. Our guiding question today is going to look at what were the requirements to get this land under the Homestead Act, and then what were the challenges for these homesteaders, what were some of the difficulties they had for coming here to the West? So what was the Homestead Act? Well, again, our favorite president here, Abraham Lincoln, uh, is going to have Congress pass a law in 1861 uh, called the Homestead Act. This law will basically offer 160 acres of land, for all intents and purposes, free uh, to anyone willing to work it for five years. The homesteaders had to keep the land clear uh, and had to farm it for five years before they received full ownership of it. Between 1860 and 1910, Farms in the U.S. literally tripled from 2 million to over 6 million during this time period. So we had a huge migration to the West to take advantage of this basically free land. The picture you see right there is actually very near and dear to my heart. This is the Cedars Hill Farm a photograph taken in 1907. This is where I grew up. This is my family's farmstead. So when we think about 160 acres, what does that mean? How much land are we actually talking about here? So let's, let's look here um, and take a little trip here to see what, what are we talking about when we think about you know, an acre? What does an acre mean? What's 160 acres mean? So let's watch here. So if you think about an acre, let's use something of a frame of reference that we are all a little bit familiar with here. So let's zoom in on a location that we spent a lot of time here at Westside Middle School. So we think about Westside Middle School and the area of the school itself, and we think, of, well, how much is an acre? Well, an acre is about the size of the football field. That's about what, what an acre is. So we take about the size of one football field, and we add 160 acres. How much land are we talking about? Well, 160 acres is about a, this area here we see here, Westside Middle School down here in the south, Westside High School and the surrounding neighborhood. That's about 160 acres here. So if we zoom back out and we go to where I grew up, uh, the Cedars Hill Farm, which is my family's farmstead, um, what does that look like in terms of area and, and land size? So we'll take a little, little trip here. Uh, there's no place like home. It's the Cedars Hills Farm. It's where I grew up. So what does 160 acres look like there? Well, if we think about 160 acres, it's this size of land. It's a pretty good chunk of territory, actually. That's about 160 acres of land. Now, if you look on the map, you can kind of notice there's kind of grids on the map. That actually is about 160 acres. So if you look at an aerial map of, of rural Nebraska and the Midwest, you'll see kind of these acres set up. So that's what 160 acres is. It's about uh, 160 football fields uh, in, in terms of size. So for my family, uh, this is my ancestors here, my great-great-grandfather who fought in the Civil War. And we'll listen and hear more about his involvement later on as we discuss the Civil War. He brought his family over uh, post-Civil War, and this is my family today. And this is what the farmstead looked like back in 1907. And you can kind of see how that's lots changed in over 100 years uh, as my family has had continuous ownership of that, that homestead. Uh, and it's like a lot of families here in the Midwest and in New Nebraska, where you have had families who've had the land in their family for, for quite some time. So why did the homesteaders go west? Why did my great-great-grandfather choose to leave Ohio behind and come to the Midwest in the middle of, of the country? Well, free land. Who doesn't like a free land? Who doesn't like free things? It's, it's a pretty cheap price. If you're willing to work it for five years, that large part of land is, is yours, and it's yours to, to do with as you need to. Some are seeking religious freedom, getting away from religious persecutions from either Europe or from the eastern parts of the United States. Uh, a lot of eastern farm families, um, especially younger children, uh, where their older siblings had the family farm, 
passed down to them, and they really were not left with anything. So they came to the Midwest and the Great Plains to find it. A lot of African Americans actually moved out to the Midwest to take advantage of the Homestead Act. There was no r uh, race requirement. Any, it was open to anybody. And so former slaves and even immigrants from Europe came. The picture you see here is of Daniel Freeman. He is the actual first homesteader that took advantage of the Homestead Act, and he will settle near uh, to modern day Beatrice, Nebraska in 1863. And actually the, the Homestead National Park, a national park through our National Park Service is actually located outside of Beatrice, Nebraska. In the uh, on-demand video lecture series, um, there is a video of Story of Us that talks a little bit about the Homestead Act and homesteaders. I definitely would encourage you to watch this video. It does a very good job of telling the story about the experiences from going west and some of the hardships. I want you to look at the following map here. And I've kind of drew, drew a line here uh, between the old eastern parts of the United States and the western parts of the United States. Most of our homesteaders are going to settle in this region here where these wagons are located. I want you to think about what would be a challenge, do you think, of these farmers moving into this part of the country from what they're used to maybe in places like Ohio or Indiana or Illinois, like Ohio or my great-great-grandfather. So think about what some challenges they might have here. If you said it was really dry, you got it. This part of the country gets unpredictable rainfall, and it can have periods of long, extended droughts. The rainfall is a little bit more consistent here in this part of the country, more reliable. Out here on the Great Plains, not so much. Some years it's wet, some years it can get very, very dry. And then if you're somebody who works with plants, you know that it doesn't rain. Plants don't survive very long without that rainfall. So the hardships of the homesteaders, probably the biggest one was this unpredictable rainfall. Sometimes it would have enough rain to grow the crops. A lot of times it was too dry and they end up having to leave the homestead and go back east. Another constant nuisance was something called a locust. If you saw the video from the story of us, you, you saw the massive cloud of swarms of locusts. These were like grasshoppers that uh, kind of came out of uh, eastern Colorado and this devoured everything in their, in their path, it just ate everything. And in fact, um, as an alumni of the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, uh, the original mascot, one of the original names of our, of our team was the Bug Eaters, because the only thing they wanted to eat was bugs. Ugh. Um, and of course, living on the Great Plains, there's not a lot of trees. Uh, and so this is where we see the sod homes, houses made out of dirt. So you're living in basically a dirt home, which is full of bugs and snakes and mice and other creepy crawly things, because it's not a house, it's basically a sod cave that you're living in. So a little difficult for these early homesteaders out in the Great Plains. Despite these hardships, many of them stuck it out. Um, they did find an existence and a living out on the Great Plains, and they ended up turning the Great Plains into probably one of the most productive agricultural regions in the world. A lot of corn is grown here in Nebraska. In Kansas and the Dakotas, a lot of wheat is grown. Uh, it's probably one of the most productive agricultural areas in the, in the world uh, has come out of this period um, of these homesteaders. And luckily, my ancestors stuck it out, and I'm here today because of their willingness to take advantage of this, this territory, this land. So that's the Homestead Act. Uh, again, thinking about why would people, what do people have to do to take it? Uh, just farm it for five years and it's yours. Um, and then the, the difficulties and hardships, the lack of rainfall, the locusts, the swarms of insects that would devour everything, and of course, you know, living in a dirt home. But despite these problems, you know, here we are, uh, one of the most agricultural regions of the world, one of the most productive agricultural regions in the world. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture and learned some things from your textbook. As always, if you have questions, good luck, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.